Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for this webinar on protecting survivors' privacy rights, survivor advocate privilege, mandatory reporting, and more. Uh, we really appreciate you being with us during this next two hours. We understand that sometimes it's hard to sit and listen to a full recording for two hours, so please feel free to take care of yourself. Uh, we'll actually be suggesting that you pause at the webinar at different times so that you can th think through some of the things that we're talking about. But we also encourage you just to take care of yourself if you need to step away, get a drink of water, take a break, uh, please do so. My name is Deborah Doherty. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an attorney at the State Support Unit of Oregon Law Center. Oregon Law Center is the sister organization to Legal Aid Services of Oregon. Um, and in combination with Legal Aid, we serve survivors throughout the state of Oregon, um, low-income Oregonians in a number of areas of the law, including um, housing, public benefits, um, employment law, and a number of civil areas of the law. I, my work is to exclusively represent and support attorneys who are representing survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking in uh, mostly family law and restraining order matters. Thanks so much for having us here today again, and I'm pleased to introduce my co-host, Jesse Minlin. Thanks so much, Deborah. And greetings, everyone. I'm Jesse Midland with the Victim Rights Law Center. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And just briefly, the Victim Rights Law Center provides free legal services to rape and sexual assault survivors here in Oregon. And we um, work exclusively with sexual assault survivors. We do not do any family law, but we do provide legal representation in the areas of privacy safety, housing, employment, immigration, education, financial stability, criminal justice, advocacy, and more. And then we're also fortunate enough to receive some funding from the Office on Violence Against Women to provide legal technical assistance to do sort of mentoring, training, consulting, create resources, and essentially sort of be the go-to lawyers for um, certain OVW funded lawyers and advocates around the country who are also serving survivors of gender-based violence. And I'm very excited and happy to be here presenting to all of you today with my wonderful colleague and friend, Deborah Doherty. I come to you today um, here from Portland, Oregon. And I want to acknowledge that the lands on which I reside are the unceded lands of the Multnomah, the Kathlamet, uh, Clackamas, Tumwater, Tualatin, uh, Kalapuya, Wasco, Malala, Cowlitz, um, and Watlala bands of the Chinook and the many other tribes who for many centuries made their homes along the Columbia River. And today the people from these bands have become part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, as well as the Chinook Nation and the Cowlitz Nation in Washington State. And um, I think it's always just important to recognize whose lands we're occupying. And so Deborah and I wanted to share that with you. So as you know, all of you are here today to talk about you know, privacy, confidentiality, and privilege. So we wanna start by talking about why is privacy so important? And when Jesse and I over the years have done this in person, we often ask our audience and all of you have great answers always. Uh, we like to bring the voice of survivors into our, uh, into our trainings as well. And so this first slide uh, is from a, a project called Surviving the Numbers. And it's a project where uh, sexual assault survivors have talked about or have provided information about the numbers related to their experience of being sexually assaulted and uh, at the aftermath. This survivor talks about having told four close family members and hearing from them that they told me I was now damaged goods and that I should keep this secret within the family. We know that privacy is so significant because we do still live in a victim blaming society and survivors often experience self blame and shame after having experienced domestic or sexual violence. There is also some very important hashtags that became very popular in uh, trending over the last several years. Um, the first is why women don't report and this has become popular at different times throughout the uh, throughout the years it became popular 
first when different folks in power uh, became were accused of sexual assault and domestic violence and particularly after some allegations against uh, Donald Trump came out, uh, the hashtag why women don't report became popular again and survivors were able to share their stories of why women don't report incidents of domestic or sexual violence. The first one you see here, a survivor said you're labeled a problem by HR. So we see that being a survivor or a uh, Experiencing sexual assault or domestic violence can impact someone's employment. Another survivor says, I was raised, I was 13 being raised in a purity culture and didn't want anyone to know I was ruined. So we know that there's implications in a person's culture or religion that may impact if the uh, information about their experience is revealed to others. Another hashtag is why I stayed. That hashtag became trending after a video of Ray Rice assaulting his then fiance, Janae Rice, came out. And we saw a lot of the victim blaming that we talk about, about why don't survivors just leave domestic relationships. And the survivor points out, since I left, my son and I have been homeless twice. So these are ultimately... Uh, a number, uh, just a few of the reasons why survivors don't leave impacts on employment, impact on housing, um, impact on the culture and the community. And then one of the most significant issues we see is safety. So the first uh, hashtag here, why I didn't report two of his fraternity brothers showed up at my dorm room the next day and threatened to kill me if I told. Uh, another survivor says he was supposed to be my friend but he beat me when I said, no, this is the first time I've talked about it in public. We know that specifically in domestic violence cases of the women who are killed by their abusers, 70% are killed during the process of trying to leave. So we know that survivors, if their privacy information is released, if they lose control of that information, then they, it very well may be a matter of life and death. It can impact their safety further. And because we know that often the dynamics, specifically in domestic violence cases, but in a number of sexual assault stalking cases as well, often power and control is at play. And when survivors keep control of their um, information, it reinforces that they have control of their information. It reinforces the dignity and um, the decision making that they get to have control over who has their information. And that's just the perfect segue for an activity that we want to invite you to engage in in this recorded webinar. And one of the beauties, right, of having it be recorded is that you can pause it when and where it's useful for you to do that. So we want to invite you or ask you to pause the video here and to take just a few moments and you know, either sort of just in your head or go ahead and print this out or, you know, sketch it on a piece of paper and answer um, these questions and reflect on them. Sort of what kinds of information are you comfortable sharing and with whom are you comfortable sharing it? So as you think about your name, your address, your date of birth, whether you consume alcohol and if so, how much? And if you don't, why not? whether you've ever been in a relationship that you now consider to be unhealthy, and what sexually intimate acts you most prefer. And you think about that information, the answers to those questions, with whom would you be comfortable sharing it? And across the top, it's a friend, a family member, a coworker, a police officer or law enforcement, an attorney, whether it's your attorney or the a defendant or respondent's attorney in a criminal or a civil matter, um, or documents that are in court and become available or become part of the court record. So again, we're just going to invite you to pause and to reflect on that, and then to come back and resume this webinar when you're ready to do that. The reason that we asked you to engage in this exercise is that um, it's information that we routinely are asking and in fact, expecting survivors to share with us. And the us, sort of the, the victim service provider and the first responder community, 
you know, really at large. And certainly when it comes to um, police officer or the courts or lawyers. And in fact, we may be asking them to share this information really right in the immediate aftermath of an incident of abuse or a sexual assault. And also it is often inadvertently the trigger for information being shared with other people. That what happens is um, they may share it with their lawyer, they may share it with the district attorney. And in turn, right, what unfolds is, it get, or they share it with a victim advocate who works at the prosecutor's office. And what unfolds is that goes from that advocate to the DA. There's anything that's considered exculpatory, which might lead to information um, that, about the a criminal defendant's um, potential innocence, for example. It gets shared with the defense attorney, with the defendant. And we always want to ensure that as survivor-centered victim service providers, that we are informing them, first of all, what may happen to the information that they share with others, and also to reflect on our own practices. What information are we gathering and why are we gathering that information? Do we need it? So that was our goal in having you complete this reflection activity. You know, we often use the terms privacy, confidentiality, privilege um, interchangeably, or maybe a few of those, you know, privacy interchangeably with confidentiality. And in terms of advocate privilege and Oregon law, they actually, um, the smaller, the two smaller concentric circles, confidentiality and privilege, actually have some very specific meaning, meanings. And we'll be delving into that in a little bit more detail in the context of this presentation today. But we wanna start off with this concept that there is a difference in how we use these terms between privacy writ large, confidentiality, which is this subset, and then privilege, which is actually a rule of evidence. So the next activity that we're going to invite you to engage in today, and again, feel free to just pause this webinar, is to answer um, these self-assessment questions. And these are all questions that we will be answering throughout the course of our webinar as you view it today. And the first is, are your communications with a survivor privileged under Oregon law? And your answer might be yes, it may be no, it might be, I don't know, that's just fine too. And you're answering these really for yourselves right now. Are you a mandatory reporter of child abuse? Are there specific requirements for Oregon's 40 hour advocate training for someone to be a certified advocate? Who may sign the release for a 14 year old victim's counseling records in Oregon? Is it the teen only? the non-abusive parent only? Is it the teen, the 14-year-old plus the non-abusive parent? Number five, if a survivor allows their advocate to talk with their lawyer, is this a waiver of Oregon's attorney-client privilege and or is it a waiver of the victim advocate privilege? Number six, what age triggers a report of elder abuse in Oregon? And number seven, in Oregon, does advocate privilege survive a victim's death? So again, just invite you to pause and to answer those questions. And um, sometimes it helps to just put a line down the middle of the page. So you have your questions that you're answering now on the left. And then as we go through it, you can either answer them again or at the end of this training, repeat that self-assessment um, exercise. So we've used a number of terms already in this presentation and we'll be using some more. I mentioned we talked about privacy, confidentiality and privilege. So just briefly to touch on confidentiality, it's actually defined in the Oregon statute in the context of your work with survivors. So we're gonna look first at that. So confidentiality is a legal and or it could be an ethical requirement or obligation not to disclose the content of a communication that you're having with an individual. So it may be both legal, it also may be ethical. So for certain professions, for example, there are ethical confidentiality requirements. 
And this is a term that's defined actually in the Oregon statute. And we're just gonna be looking that, at that in a bit more detail. So advocate confidentiality here in Oregon is governed by the statute that's at ORS, which stands for Oregon Revised Statute 147.600. And if you ever want to go and look at the statute you know, on your own, you can just put that into your search tool, ORS 147.600, and it'll bring up the statute that we're talking about today. So for ad advocate confidentiality in Oregon, there are really four key terms that we're looking at. How is a victim defined? How is certified advocate defined? What's a qualified victim services program? And what is a confidential communication? And we're gonna walk you through each of those and also why they're so important. So the statute defines a victim as a person seeking safety planning, counseling, support, or advocacy services related to domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking at a qualified victim services program. And I just wanna underscore that they must be seeking services related to that safety planning, counseling, support, or advocacy. They're not seeking any four of those or it's related to that, excuse me, related to their experiences as a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking, then they may not meet the definition of victim. So what else is there? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, to be a certified advocate here in Oregon, 147.600 says that you have to go through four and complete 40 hours of training that's been approved by the attorney general. And the statute actually gets even more specific. And it says that two of those hours must be specifically on confidentiality and privilege. And my guess is that for many, not most or even all of you, um, that's why you're viewing this webinar, right? It's to ensure that you meet the qualifications to become a certified advocate whose communications are covered by confidentiality and privilege. But in addition to completing those 40 hours, you must also be a volunteer or an employee of a qualified victim services program. So of course the question becomes, what's a qualified victim services program? And we have that for you as well. And this is just an abbreviation. Um, again, if you want to look at the definition of qualified victim services program, you can go to 147600. Um, and then just the one and a little c, and you'll find the definition there. But essentially a qualified victim services program, which I think we may abbreviate in certain places in this presentation as a QVSP, um, which always makes me think of like that online shopping thing, which we are definitely not. Um, but essentially it is a, it's a non-governmental um, or non-governmental, community-based program. So right then and there, if it's a program um, that's based out of law enforcement or out of the district attorney's office, that does not count because those are governmental agencies. So it's a non-governmental, non-profit, community-based program or a sexual assault center or a victim advocacy office. It could be the student affairs center or a health center or other program at um, a two or four year post-secondary, so post high school institution in Oregon. And it must provide, that program must provide safety planning or counseling support or advocacy services. Again, as we mentioned earlier, um, it, plus it must also receive money that is administered by the Department of Human Services or Oregon Department of Justice. So for those of you who receive funding from the Crime Victim and Survivor Services Division, that's part of Oregon DOJ, or the US Department of Justice, and that could include um, a Violence Against Women grant, STOP money, for example, um, or it could be a program that's administered by a tribal government. So that's what it takes in Oregon to be a, a qualified victim services program the 40 hours of training in order to be um, a certified advocate, 
two hours of those 40 specifically have to be on privacy, privilege, confidentiality, um, and you need to be providing the services that are covered to a person who's coming to you seeking assistance for the reasons related to their victimization as a domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking survivor. And now I'm gonna turn it over to you, Deborah. Oops. And I'm gonna ask you a question. Deborah, does the 40 hour training to be a certified advocate have to include certain topics? To see, that's an excellent question. As a matter of fact, it does. And the Oregon regulation is very specific about this. And we've seen, uh, you've already filled out your pretest. This was question number three on your pretest. So let's see how you did. Certified advocate training uh, is uh, in the Oregon advised rules, 137.085.0080. The rules are very specific about what must be included in that 40 hours. So you can't just decide, oh, I'm gonna do 40 hours loosely based on domestic and sexual violence, and that will be enough. Um, in fact, there has to be 12 hours on one of the subjects on the left-hand column here, including working with law enforcement, SANE exams, campus response, shelter intake, and you have to have at least 26 hours on all of the things in the right-hand column, including anti-oppression, anti-racism, cultural competency theory and practice, um, effects of exposure to violence on kids, advocacy skills, working with systems-based partners like victims advocate programs at district attorney's offices, et cetera. And again, you'll see this two-hour webinar is specifically required or a two-hour training on confidentiality and privilege is specifically required. Right. That's okay. In addition, Jesse was getting there. That was step. Yeah, the statute makes it clear that each qualified victim service provider, and there's that QVSP uh, acronym that Jesse was mentioning, must maintain a roster of advocates who have completed the minimum training and are thus certified advocates. So the takeaway is make sure you're on the roster when your training is complete. And for any EDs out there or leaders in the program, there are some great materials on CVSSD's website, Crime Victims and Survivor Services Division website, that include uh, getting the certification from employees. And we have a link to that a little bit later in the training. Confidential communications, as we mentioned, right, there's a definition of confidentiality that's different from privacy. Um, oftentimes we think of, conf of privacy just with this general expectation that information that people share with you is going to remain private, right? Like when I vent to one of my friends, I don't expect them to tell it to their partner or to other friends with whom we may have in common, but it's just that general expectation of sort of being a good person in the world or being a good friend or ally. Versus confidentiality, as I mentioned earlier, is going to have, um, it may have an ethical, it may also and or be a legal requirement. And Oregon, the statute defines what is a confidential communication. So a confidential communication is one that could be either written or it could be oral or both. So in other words, one that is, um, that is heard, it also could be in writing. And it is not intended for further disclosure. In other words, the expectation is that the person with whom, to whom you're telling this, with whom you're sharing this information is going to keep it in confidence. Except, and this is really where I think Oregon's law is so wonderful and really very much unique, that in Oregon under 147.600, a communication is still confidential if, it's um, being made in the context of group counseling, right? It used to be years ago that we would advise, no, it's made where other people are present in the context of group counseling that a communication wouldn't be private or confidential. But the statute now that we have a privilege statute says that it is or confidentiality statute. So number one, it's still confidential if it's made in group counseling. Number two, it's also considered confidential if it's um, shared with somebody else that may be reasonably necessary for the transmission. I think an obvious example of that is you're, if you're working with an interpreter um, who speaks a second language, whether that's ASL or language from a different country, that's someone who's reasonably necessary. 
you know, we've often are asked, well, would it be reasonably necessary if it's, for example, someone who's very traumatized and needs another person in the room, or it's a, a minor who needs a parent or a guardian who's not abusive or other adult to support them. There isn't case law on it. I would just say that if you're going to allow that other person under the theory that they're reasonably necessary for the transmission, I would document why it is that you believe that and what the factors were that you considered it. Um, reasonably be necessary to accomplish the purpose for which the advocate is consulted. And again, I think I kind of maybe just blurred those last two points. Um, but if the person is necessary, another example, by the way, of reasonably necessary for the transmission could be if you are using like a TDT or a TTY or some other relay service to communicate with someone who is deaf or hard of hearing. That's someone who clearly is reasonably necessary for the transmission. So um, what does this all mean, right? If you have these confidential communications, well, the statute says that you may not disclose um, confidential communications or records without the written and informed consent of the victim and that that consent needs to be reasonably limited in duration. There are very limited exceptions that will apply in the circumstance um, they have to do, for example, if the survivor who was served is suing the advocacy program, um, there may be an exception for that. But if they're suing somebody else, then there's not necessarily an exception to that. Um, the, but so again, the exceptions are very, very limited. We've given you sort of the citations, but the overwhelming general rule is that they may not be disclosed. And we'll talk more about sort of some other exceptions that may apply. One of the other questions that we, oh, oh look here, I have it here. <laughs> the certified advocate or the qualified victim service program may disclose confidential communications or records without the victim's consent to the extent that there's, um, it's necessary for a defense that's brought against the program by or on behalf of the victim. And I remember early on when we were drafting, I think these, this language, um, an institution said, well, what if we get sued and we want to be able to reveal their records? It's like, well, if you're not the advocate and you're not the QVSB, then you are not authorized under this statute to release those confidential communications. And then there's this other very important exception, which is as otherwise required by law. And we're going to delve into um, what does that mean in terms of as otherwise required by law. And Deborah, I think I, I'm returning it back over to you now. Oh. Oh. Yes, you are. Thank you. So thanks so much for all of that great information on confidentiality. As we've talked about, privacy is sort of an umbrella term that we've been talking about. Confidentiality is part of that. And privilege is sort of a part of this confidentiality, uh, these communications that we're talking about. And you'll hear a lot of the same language in the privilege statutes and the privilege laws surrounding advocate privilege. So victim advocate privilege is a rule of evidence in Oregon. Uh, you can find it at Oregon Revised Statute 40.264 uh, in the Evidence Code of Oregon Law. And basically, the privilege statute says, look, if you have all those provisions that Jesse just told us about in our confidentiality statute, if you have a victim, you have a certified advocate, you have a qualified victim service provider, and you have some communication that is confidential and not intended for further disclosure, then that information is going to be privileged in criminal, civil, administrative, or school, post-secondary school disciplinary proceedings. So what does that mean? How does privilege work? And sorry, I'm jumping around with those slides. Um, again, it's a rule of evidence that basically says a victim may not be forced to testify or otherwise disclose those confidential communications they've had with an advocate in any of those hearings. So if a victim or survivor is subpoenaed to a civil case or a school disciplinary proceeding or a criminal case, they cannot be forced to testify about a communication, a confidential communication they had with the certified advocate working at a qualified victim service provider, et cetera. In addition, that survivor 
can prevent someone else from disclosing both those confidential communications as well as any records created or maintained as a part of getting those services with the confidential organization. Pull out your pretest again. This is one of those questions. So uh, as many of you have heard, you're very uh, probably very familiar just out there in the ether with doctor patient privilege or attorney client privilege. One of the questions we had is what if a survivor says it's okay for my lawyer to talk with my advocate, recognizing that the survivor has attorney client privilege and the survivor has advocate survivor privilege. Therefore, when the lawyer and the advocate speak with one another, that information remains privileged. In other situations, if they would speak with someone else who doesn't have a privileged relationship with that survivor, that privileged communication can be harmed. It can be what we call sort of open the door to getting more information. But privilege in Oregon stays between providers so that communication remains privileged. Now, the rule that we're talking about, the evidence rule that we're talking about is in the Oregon statute, is in the Oregon evidence code which means that certified advocates who work at tribal government-based programs, the, our statute explicitly states, tribal advocates also have this advocate privilege that's in Oregon state law. However, the law only applies in tribal court if the tribe says it applies. As many of you know, tribal courts are sovereign nations, they're sovereign jurisdictions, they have their own laws, and they determine how other laws would apply in their courts. Therefore, again, the Oregon evidence rule that says advocates are privileged, even tribal advocates are privileged, that is an Oregon law that applies in Oregon state courts, but it only applies in tribal courts if the court says so. And I think I've kind of jumped ahead and said what's on this slide as well. So what does this tribal state law distinction mean? It means if an advocate at a tribal government-based program with advocate privilege, so has all of those, takes all of those other boxes that Jesse was telling us about, um, is subpoenaed to testify in state court, then the Oregon Evidence Code says that communication is privileged and that advocate cannot be forced to testify. The survivor can say, I don't want that information released and the privilege will hold. However, if that same advocate is subpoenaed to testify in tribal court, then the Oregon advocate privilege applies only if the tribe says it does. The tribe may have its own laws about what advocate privilege might look like under its own tribal code, However, the Oregon code cannot say this applies also in tribal court. So this is an important distinction, especially for those advocates who work closely uh, with survivors and other tribal advocates or survivors who are uh, tribal members. Jesse, I think you had a question for me about this. I love asking you questions, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> the question I'm saying is, can you just sort of walk us through how Oregon's advocate privilege like would apply in state and or in tribal court? So I know that you just explained it, but maybe walking us through it a little bit more. Yeah, so it's important, as I said, for advocates to know how Oregon's privilege laws and confidentiality law apply in state court, but not necessarily tribal court. And again, I'm going to encourage any advocates who work closely with uh, tribal communities to make sure they understand what the tribal code says about their own advocate privilege and have those communications with uh, the same community programs that serve their clients as far as what works in what direction. One of the best ways I think to illustrate this is by looking at a actual scenario. So if you think about Justina, okay, let's use our example of Justina as an advocate. She's a part-time advocate with a tribal domestic violence and sexual assault program. And she's helped Denise, who's a survivor who lives on a reservation. She's helped Denise apply for a civil protection order at the Wasco County Courthouse. The Wasco County Courthouse is an Oregon state courthouse, right? The respondent, so the other side in the civil protection order, the person against whom the protection order uh, 
or against whom Denise got the protection order, contests or asks for a hearing in the civil protection order. And he claims Denise lied in the petition and that Justina, her advocate, knows that Denise is lying. So respondent subpoenas Justina to testify at the contested civil protection order hearing because he wants to say that he wants just to hear Justina say, yeah, Denise told me something different, right? He wants to hear what uh, Justine, what Denise told Justina. He also subpoenas Justina to testify as a witness at a different hearing in tribal court. So the question is, does Oregon state privilege apply in state court? Jesse, do you want to give any input on this? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yes, 147600 will apply in state court, assuming that um, Justina is in fact a certified advocate. So it's gone through the 40 hours of training, two hours of pri privilege, confidentiality, um, works for a QVSP, et cetera. Great. And what about advocate privilege ORS 147600? Does it apply in tribal court? Well, the Oregon state statute itself would not per se apply in tribal court. The tribal court might have their own privilege statute. They might have made a decision that they're going to recognize the provisions of certified advocates from other jurisdictions, which could include Oregon, could include Washington or Oklahoma or anywhere else. But um, because tribes are sovereign nations, it's really up to them to decide what the rules of privilege will be in their own courts. And one um, example that I sometimes give when, you know, just conceptually can help folks kind of wrap their mind around some of these differences is really this emphasis on the fact that tribes are sovereign nations, right? So for example, Oregon State would never tell, you know, Canada or Sweden for Australia, what their laws are going to be in the Australian courts or Canadian courts, et cetera. And that we need to think of tribes in that same way as sovereign nations. They can um, execute, sign and enforce treaties with other nations, et cetera. Great, thanks, Jesse. And as we've said, you know, it's so important if you're working with tribal communities, if you're a DVSA advocate, either on, uh, either working with a tribal government agency or uh, that you work with a nonprofit DVSA agency, but who works closely with tribal members, then make sure that you understand this and make sure one of the most important things Justina could do is tell Denise even before working with Denise, these are my obligations. This is the privilege and the confidentiality requirements I have, and they hold in state court. In tribal court, this is what the rules of our particular tribal community that we're working with and our tr particular tribal code says about it. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily translate unless the tribal code says it does or necessarily apply unless the tribal code says it does. So again, Justina informing Denise, here are my obligations, here are my privileges and my confidentiality requirements, and here is where they apply is most important. Let's turn to some of our favorite topics, releases, consent, and court and statutory mandates. What are your probably, excuse me, your privacy obligations as victim service providers? And I'm gonna start with what the requirements are that we know from the Oregon CVSSD funding, and they really mirror what the confidentiality obligations are for anyone that receives money through the Violence Against Women Act. And again, that could be through the, um, administered by the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. It could be VAWA STOP. You may have a direct grant from OVW, such as um, you know, a rural grant or a safe visitation or something like that. So the general language, the general requirements are your, your, your sort of foundation, right? Your, the bottom, <clears throat> excuse me, is that grantees and sub-grantees, in other words, if you're passing money through to a grant partner, an organization with whom you're working and they are your sub-grantee, 
that grantees and subgrantees who receive this money, they may not disclose personally identifying information or reveal any individual client information about anyone who sought, received, or was denied services. So that's sort of the threshold rule. And then we're gonna talk about what's personally identifying, but the reason that the sought, received, or was denied services is in bold is really to bring your attention to the fact that includes people you've never served, but if they are a victim as that is defined, and they came to you for services and they were denied, maybe you were at capacity, there may have been another reason, um, but that these confidentiality obligations will also apply to them. So you may not disclose, you may not reveal personally identifying information unless, and there are three exceptions. And here's what they are. The first is that the survivor gives written and informed consent. And there too, we're gonna really delve deep into the details. So unless one, the survivor gives a written informed consent or the release is compelled, it's required, it's a must or you shall, it's required by either a statutory mandate, for example, an abuse reporting law or by a court mandate. And we're going to go into all of these in just a lot more detail now. So let's look at those three exceptions and how we're going to analyze when we have um, information and what to do with it, whether it may be shared and if so, how. So the key terms in that definition of the obligation that you all have were personally identifying information, the reference to written and informed consent, what's a statutory mandate, and what's a court mandate. So personally identifying information, it is not one hard and fast rule about what makes um, something personally identifying. It could be a student ID number. I mean, obviously it could be a name or um, somebody's passport number or their address. It could be their driver's license number. Uh, it could be their tribal affiliation. It could be their internet provider, their IP address, and it could be any, or their faith, their religion, especially in small communities. And it could, it could become personally identifying by any single one of these factors or by some combination of them. So for example, you know, if your name is Jane White, there may be a bazillion Jane Whites in your city. But if you know it's Jane White that lives at you know, 802 Franklin Avenue, then of course that becomes personally identifying. So the other required, the other exception, right? There were three exceptions, written and informed consent, statutory mandate, court mandate. So let's look at this written and informed consent because it's easy to say, oh, I got consent and sure it was informed. But the wonderful thing about the federal law and the state guidance is that there are actually definitions for what constitutes written and informed consent. And for those of you who might want to go look it up, um, you know, if you're curious, well, where is this? Uh, I'll just share the, the citation here of the federal law. If you were to put into your search bar, your search tool, 28 CFR, which is the abbreviation for Code of Federal Regulations, 28 CFR 90.4, then you would get to this definition. So let's look, what is written and informed consent? Well, first of all, it needs to be clearly defined. What is the scope of the authorization of the consent that the person is giving? And the example that I always use and for those of you who've heard me present before, I'm sure you've heard this because it's, I think, a great example is that many, many years ago when I worked at a public defender office before law school, I would hand my clients that I was working with a piece of paper and say, here's a release of information. Just fill out your name, your date of birth, your social security number, and don't worry, I'll go and fill out the rest. That's not informed consent. There's no clearly defined scope. They didn't know what I was asking for and from whom. So you have to say what you're asking for. It cannot be a blanket release and it must be time limited. 
For how much time? Well, that depends. It needs to be reasonably time limited. Your release of information might be for an hour, a day, a week, a month, six months. You know, generally speaking at the Victim Rights Law Center, we don't do releases of information for more than six months. That doesn't mean that we've wrapped up our cases in that time, especially you know, some of our immigration um, cases, for example. They may go on for three, four, five or more years. But having a time limited release of information, it really compels us to check back it in with our survivor clients and say, are you still comfortable with having me release this information to this individual or to these individuals or to sharing this? Have your circumstances changed? And so it's a really great practice to not just do a release of information that's valid for you know, two, three, four years. It must be revocable. So the person who's given you consent needs to be able to cancel it. Nowhere in any of these statutes or requirement does it say that the revocation of a release of information has to be in writing. It's you know, great to confirm it, but I think um, it's not a barrier that we would ever want to impose on a survivor who would change their mind about what information they were comfortable sharing. And then lastly, signing this release of information, it may not be a condition for your providing services. Are there certain services that you may not be able to provide if the survivor doesn't sign a release? Sure. If someone says, for example, I don't want this personal information being shared with um, law enforcement, and you're part of, let's say, a domestic violence um, reduction team that is working collaboratively well, if you, then you're not going to share your information perhaps at that meeting about this survivor, or you're going to ask law enforcement to step out of the room. But you cannot say, well, if you're not going to sign a release of information, then we're not going to serve you at all. You have to find ways of providing some services. So then there's one other provision, and again, I'm not making this up. This is actually in that federal regulation, the citation that I shared with all of you, which is that in order for it to be informed consent, there's a process you need to go through with the survivor. I like the acronym DARE. It could be RAD. It could be READ. Um, Whichever way works best for you. You know, I like mnemonic devices. They help me remember things. Um, and that is that you have to discuss with the survivor what information is going to be shared, who's going to have access, and with whom might that information be shared. And if you think back on that reflection exercise that we did at the very beginning about sharing your information with friends, coworkers, family members, law enforcement, court records, et cetera, that you want to have this conversation with the survivor. If you put this information, or if you give me permission, let's say, to testify about X, Y, and Z, that's going to be in the court record. It will be part of the court transcript. This is who will have access to it, et cetera. And then, of course, you and the survivor just need to agree on what information will be shared and with whom. And then you need to have a record of that agreement. And that's what the release of information is. There's nothing magical about the release of information forms that we use, other than that they are our effort to ensure that the survivor has really given that um, informed consent. And I mentioned that there was the, uh, the citation, the 28 CFR, that's the Code of Federal Regulations, another place where um, you can find this requirement for any VAWA or Violence Against Women Act funded victim service provider is at 34 USC 12291B2 and USC stands for US code. And there's a little bit of difference between the information in the USC citation versus the CFR, the regulation. Um, for example, I think it's only the regulation that it says that the agreement has to, uh, the release of information agreement um, must be in writing and signed by the survivor. So turning towards this question of, right, okay, you know that you need to have a release and it needs to be in writing. Well, the question is like, who signs that release? And again, it's made easy for us in the 
to know who signs it um, because there, guide, there is guidance both in the federal statutes and regulation and also from the CVSSD requirements. Well, who signs it? If the survivor has legal capacity to consent to the service, and I'll come back to how you might be able to know that, then only the victim is required to sign the release. If it's a minor who doesn't have legal capacity, then the law requires that it be that minor victim plus their non-abusive parent or guardian. And I know the question sometimes arises, well, what if their only parent or guardian is um, abusive? You know, then you need to find um, a different authorized individual to sign that release. And that might be a short-term appointment by the court of a guardian ad litem. Um, so then again, if it's a minor who lacks capacity, it's the victim plus the non-abusive parent or guardian. It's different if you have a person with a legally appointed guardian and they lack legal capacity to consent. So for example, um, you might have someone who has significant um, intellectual or developmental disabilities and the court has appointed a guardian for that individual and the guardian has specifically been given authority um, to consent to the receipt of services then it would be only the guardian who must sign. The statute doesn't actually require the survivor's signature. And then lastly, well, what do you do if you have a minor who's just really incapable of knowingly consenting? If you're serving a five or a six or a seven-year-old, then it's only the parent or the guardian must sign. And you inform the minor, you know, as appropriate. So let's say they are in, you know, engaging in a child therapy program. You may explain to them, I'm going to be talking to so-and-so, and we want to figure out how best um, we can share information to help you. And you're, you know, so-and-so, mom, other mom, dad, whomever it is, um, has said that that's okay. And I'm I hope that that's okay with you too. In other words, explain as age appropriate. So how do you know if um, a minor has legal capacity to consent? Again, here too, it's great because Oregon law actually gives us some guidance. So for example, it tells us a minor of any age may consent to medical or surgical care or hospital care that is related to the treatment of a sexually transmitted infection or if they're unmarried and the custodial parent, right? We've lots of minors who are parents um, or they um, are pregnant and expect to be the custodial parent of that child when it's born. They can rent an apartment, they can contract for utilities. And in Oregon, the law is for outpatient mental health um, or for drug or alcohol treatment, then the age of consent is 14 or older. I do wanna point out that last bullet, which is that that healthcare provider, that mental health provider may inform the parent of the services that the minor is receiving without the minor's consent under certain circumstances. Um, and then for medical care, it is going to be 15 or older. So those are the, um, the ages of consent in Oregon. We've given you the statutes. And you may have noticed that there's a glaring omission or here, which is that there isn't a specific age at which a minor may consent to advocacy services. Oregon doesn't have a law on that. Um, I don't personally anticipate that there's going to be a statute coming down the pike anytime soon. And so if you are serving minors, I would engage in some analysis as to why you believe that the minor has the capacity to consent to that service. There sometimes are tricky situations where you have a parent or guardian or um, child welfare who is asking for the records. And hopefully if you are working for a program that has a relationship with an attorney who can advise you if that does come up. So we're gonna do a self-assessment, a review question. This was question number four in that self-assessment at the beginning. Who may sign the release of information for a 14-year-old victim's counseling records in Oregon? 
Is it A, a teen only, B, a non-abusive parent only, or C, the teen, the 14-year-old, plus the non-abusive parent? I'm going to pause a moment to give you time to answer that question on your own. And then I'm going to ask Deborah to answer it for you. So Deborah, 14-year-old survivor who's been in counseling in Oregon, who may sign the release of information, let's say the advocate would like to speak with um, the counselor or would like to get the counseling records to support them in their work with a minor survivor. Is it A? teen only, B, non-abusive parent only, or C, teen and non-abusive parent. Well, Jesse, thanks to your two previous slides that were very clear and the chart that VRLC has about minors and consent in Oregon, I know that minors 14 years or older do have the authority to consent to getting the services of counseling. So if minors can get counseling um, a minor at the age of 14 year old can get counseling, then they only they need to sign a release of information to release those counseling records. So I'm going to choose a teen only. Yes, you got the right answer. Yes. <laughs> we were in person, you'd get you'd get the little candy bar with some other treat, uh, um, tangerine or whatever it is. Right. So the answer there is going to be teen only because in Oregon, 14 year old or may consent to counseling. So signing the release of information follows who's got capacity to consent. So now we're going to do a scenario. I'll go ahead and read it, Deborah, and then do you want to maybe ask the questions? Sure. Serving survivors who are minors. Eliza comes to your community-based program. It's a victim services program that's providing domestic violence and sexual assault advocacy and counseling. And Eliza's dad contacts you asking to see Eliza's file from your organization. What do you do? So the questions here are, what additional information would you need? What do you do in response to Eliza's dad's request? Will your response vary based on Eliza's age? And if so, what ages will influence or determine your response? And based on, based on your answer to the one above, question above, what do you wish you'd done at the outset of providing services to Eliza, you as the advocate? And then finally, are there any policies you wish you had in place that you could refer to when this question comes to you? So why don't we chat about that, Deborah, you and I. Um, what additional information do you need? I think the first thing is you need to know um, how old is Eliza? Right? We Absolutely. haven't given that to you in these facts. We've obviously said, you know, it's someone who's a minor, but there's going to be a big difference between a seven-year-old and a 17-year-old. Right. I'd also like to know if Eliza's dad is an abusive parent. Is Eliza's father the reason why Eliza is seeking services through us? Right. I'd want that information as well. Absolutely. So let's chat about what do you do in response to Eliza's dad's request? Well, I think that's based a lot on the answer to the first bullet, right? Uh, as the, uh, the question in our pretest and our, our self-assessment quiz, uh, if Eliza is over 14 years old, um, then she can certainly consent to counseling records. Um, whether our organization has a policy, and this is, of course, a, a clue into a later bullet question, but whether our organization has a policy about at what age someone can access and consent to receive uh, advocacy services, even though it's not explicit in an Oregon law, if our organization has a policy about at what age Eliza can choose to receive our services, that may impact our decision about who has to sign the release of information. And um, <clears throat> so based on the answer to the question above, what do you wish you had done at the outset of providing services to Eliza? You know, the first thing is, um, if you didn't, I hope your answer is that you wish you'd had a conversation with Eliza about confidentiality laws in Oregon 
with respect to the counseling, right? Because Eliza, if they're old enough to consent, that will clearly be um, confidential. Though remember there was that exception, right? There's certain circumstances in which the provider may opt to, which if your program is the provider, I'm guessing you're probably not going to opt for that. But certainly around the advocacy, um, sharing with we're serving minors, this is the position that we take. Um, it's not an established right under the law. In our experience, you know, it's never happened or it's happened rarely, or it happens routinely, which I've never heard, that we have to share this with the parent. Um, you might think about having segregated the records. So for example, if there is counseling provided by your agency and also advocacy, that's not all one big client file so that if you have to, um, try and defend the privacy of one of them or the other. They may, you know, interesting thought actually, whether it's beneficial to have it all in one file to argue that it all comes under that 14 year old's consent to counseling statutory um, consent law. And I would say in terms of the policy, number one, have a policy that you're having these conversation with the minors that you're serving. Um, but also to have some policies that guide how you establish whether you believe that this individual can give informed consent to the services that you are offering. So for example, you know, we follow like the mature minor doctrine and this individual makes, you know, all kinds of decisions in this realm. They have been, um, you know, responsible for the other children in their home since the age of seven. They have been employed since, you know, in this area, since the age of X, Y, and Z. In other words, really kind of have documented their level of maturity as to why you feel confident that they are um, intellectually and emotionally equipped to consent to the service. Anything, Deborah, that you want to add to that? I think you've covered it, Jesse. I just think, yeah, having a policy that you will have these conversations, you know, the survivor having control of this information, as we talked about earlier a bit, and maybe I wasn't as explicit when I was talking about privacy as I intended to be, but um, making sure that survivor knows they have control over their information is going to reinforce their trust in your advocacy services and make you better able to serve them. Yeah. Knowledge is power. And, um, and one of the things that's taken away from survivors um, during the victimization and abuse is their right to self-determination, to agency, bodily autonomy and integrity. And that at the heart of providing survivor-centered services is empowering the survivors, right? Is allowing them um, and promoting their right to self-determination. And that includes the right to determine what happens with their information. So um, some great comments there, Deborah. So, and again, just to recap, um, so with a minor in Oregon, if they have capacity to consent, then they sign the release. They don't have legal capacity. It's the minor plus the non-abusive parent or guardian. And if they're too young to consent, it's only the parent or guardian, but you explain as best appropriate and um, age, appro age appropriate and able for them to understand. And, Again, here's just that quick review, right? And that we have this resource and we can send it to you. Um, our contact information, I think, is at the end of this um, if you want to print out uh, this particular slide. So let's turn to multi service organizations because here is where the, uh, the rules and the law change a little bit in terms of. Um, privacy, confidentiality, and the sharing of communication internally when you have a multi-service organization. And just to explain what I mean by um, a multi-service organization, it's an organization that is not specifically a domestic violence or sexual assault organization, but rather one that is providing just a wide variety of different services to individuals in the community. And that might be, um, for example, the YWCA, which has you know, just an umbrella of 
many different services that it provides to the community. And there, one of their programs may be specific to survivors of domestic violence and or sexual assault or stalking. Or another, I think, very clear example um, is a tribe that you may, you know, the tribes, right? They're tribal governments. They provide many, many different services to their citizens um, and also to individuals who may not be tribal citizens, but who may live um, in Indian country or on reservation land um, or to others who are parts of their community because of course, not, um, it's not always tribal land. Uh, and th within those tribes and tribal governments, there may be a specific program that is providing services to domestic violence and sexual assault survivors or stalking survivors. So what is the rule for these multi-service organizations um, with respect to sharing information internally between their programs and within one program within um, that organization or within that tribe and other programs within that organization or their tribe. And that is that a release of information, it is required to share information, a release is required um, between grantees, and this includes your partners. So for example, um, if you are an organization that is partnering, let's just say that um, the Oregon Law Center and the Victim Rights Law Center were partnering on an organization, right? They're, um, let's say we're the grantee and we're subcontract out with them because we don't do any family law and they're going to provide the family law services. Well, if they're sharing that personally identifying information about the survivors they're serving with the Victim Rights Law Center, they're going to need a release of information to share that information. So it's releases required. Also, if you have victim services and a non-victim services component within this multi-service organization. So again, the example that I gave was, you know, the YWCA or the tribe, and we're um, going to do a, a scenario and talk about this a little bit, but um, then you would need a release of information if the DVSA or domestic violence sexual assault or stalking program is going to be sharing information about a survivor or other survivors that they're serving with other components or programs or entity within their larger organization. And then finally, if you are part of a multi-service organization, and again, by multi-service, we mean one that is not exclusively a domestic violence or sexual assault or stalking provider. So if you're a multi-service organization, you may not share information with the executive director or the chief executive officer or the chief operating officer of your multi-service organization. You may not share personally identifying information about the survivors being served without a release of information. And again, just that reminder that you may not require that release of information as a condition of providing services. One thing I have come across from time to time, just in my work nationally as a technical assistance provider, is that folks who routinely attach a release of information, for example, to their services agreement, whether that's a retainer, if they're lawyers, um, or to their other intake forms, if they're a victim service provider. And I advise against that practice because sort of de facto, it so much looks like you are requiring the survivor to sign that release of information as a condition of getting the services that they want. So um, again, you can't require that release, but you do need it. There's a very rare exception that there may be sort of extraordinary and rare circumstances where a the domestic violence, sexual assault or stalking component of an organization may share information with um, their chief executive officer or their executive director, or it may be the, you know, the head of the tribal council. But those are extraordinary and they are rare. And I wanna emphasize here that monitoring or um, for supervision purposes do not meet the definition of extraordinary or rare. So for example, let's say um, tribal council is wanting to know, you know, for audit purposes, well, who did you serve? 
um, and we want their names and how much money did these individuals receive, that's monitoring and it's not, doesn't fit within that extraordinary and rare exception. So we're gonna do a scenario. And we're going to ask you for purposes of this scenario to assume that this organization is either funded by the Oregon Department of Justice's Crime Victim and Survivor Services Division um, and or they're receiving funding through the Violence Against Women Act and they're a victim service provider. So here are your facts. Do you want me to read this first one, Jesse? Sure, that would be great because I'm gonna take a sip right. of water. I'm getting sure. a little horse. Sure. So in this, um, this fact pattern, this agency's mission is to advance racial equity and social justice by empowering South Asian communities in our region. The agency does have a specific sexual assault project within the agency. So the question is, may the executive director access the files or other identifying information about the survivors served by the sexual assault project? And we, we just gave you a hint. So <laughs> we would say to pause and think about it, but... The answer is no. Yeah. So the executive director, this is the example that Jesse was just talking about, uh, except in those very limited, extraordinary and rare circumstances, the executive director may not access files without a release of information from the survivor. So as a matter of course, the executive director cannot access the files that has any identifying information about the survivor served by that project. And the reason we gave you this fact pattern where the agency's mission is to advance racial equity and social justice by empowering the South Asian community in our region is that they, um, they have this sexual assault specific project, but this is going to have them fit within the definition of that multi-services program because their mission is not to be a domestic violence or sexual assault. And you know, then, so just to give you a, a visual on this, um, Okay, here's another. The facts, the agency mission is to promote human dignity and to provide emotional, spiritual, and social assistance to those struggling with drug and alcohol addiction. The agency runs a domestic violence shelter and also an inpatient drug rehabilitation program. We have a domestic violence advocate who's very much hoping to get the survivor into rehab. They're delighted. There's like finally that, that rare event and opening you know, in the rehab program. And the advocate provides the survivor's name to the rehab program within their larger organization. And they ask the rehab program to hold the spot until the advocate can reach out, connect and speak to the survivor to tell them you know, great news, right? Um, we got you, there's a spot available for you. So the question is, is this allowable? And Deborah, the answer? The answer is no, not allowable. And this is, these are, this is one of those cases where the rubber hits the road, right? And you're like, of course, I'll always get a release of information. But then this really important situation happens and you think, well, it's got to be okay in this situation, right? But the answer is, it's not okay. You have other options. Certainly, you can ask the organization to hold the spot until you speak with the survivor and not give any identifying information about the survivor. Um, if you know that this is something you're planning to do and try and get this survivor into this program, you can ask the survivor before there is even an opening to get a release of information signed. You still want it to be reasonably time limited, right? The survivor can sign other ones, but that's going to be an important, um, that's going to be a tool that you could do rather than uh, give out this information without that release of information. I think we have one more scenario. Would you like me to read it? I'm going to let you advance the slide so we don't trick, we don't give it, give away <laughs> the answer this time. Okay. In this scenario, you are a tribal advocate who provides safety planning and support for domestic and sexual assault survivors and also helps staff of the shelter on the reservation. The tribe receives CVSSD and VAWA funding, so Crime Victims and Survivor Services Division and Violence Against Women Act funding. You have a work cell phone, the phone bill, which lists all incoming and outgoing phone numbers, 
goes directly to the tribe's finance department, who then pays the bill. Question one, is this arrangement allowable? What do you think, Jesse? I'm, I'm going to say no, it is not allowable. And the reason for that is that, that, we're, that cell, those cell phone numbers that appear on the bill are personally identifying information. If you think back on that slide, right, where we talked about, well, what is that PII or personally identifying information? It's may, very likely to be the individual's cell phone number. And particularly in this day and age, I know lots of folks who have um, sort of voice over internet protocol or VOIP um, <clears throat> services so that when you call someone or someone calls you, in fact, their name is, or the owner of that account is going to appear right on the telephone or it's going to pop up on your computer if that's how um, it's set up. So definitely not allowable because it is sharing personally identifying information between the domestic violence sexual assault program within the tribe with the tribe's finance department. One of the questions that we are um, sometimes asked is, well, then what do we do about this? And you know, there are a few practical suggestions or solutions. Um, one is to have the phone bill sent directly to that specific domestic violence, sexual assault stalking component, and then to redact, in other words, to, to block out the phone numbers um, from which phone, call, phone calls were received or where, to whom calls were made. Um, so that they can still see, you know, the date that a call was made and the length of the call, but they don't have access to any of the personally identifying information. Sometimes it's actually possible, depending upon who your phone provider is, to arrange with the phone company that when they send the bill, that that information is removed or redacted from the phone bill before it even is sent to the customer. And so if that were the case, then it could go directly to um, the tribe's finance department for payment. And you know, some another question that I know has come up is, you know, the finance department might say, well, then, you know, how do we know that this is really being used for work? They could certainly request, for, um, for example, a verification that accompany the phone bill that says, I certify that all of these phone, you know, the, that the phone is being used exclusively or primarily or whatever the requirement in a slash agreement is for work purposes from the employee. So I'm gonna do the next part and ask. Um, so you have the tribal council, they ask for a list of the survivors who received housing subsidies because they want to verify with the tribal housing agencies that all of the vouchers were properly awarded. May you, the advocate, provide that list to tribal council? And the answer is no. There is a specific allowance for providing data in the aggregate. So you could provide the numbers, for example, if those numbers don't identify any specific person. That's often what we do in grant reporting, right? We provide um, 26 survivors were served during this quarter or whatever, uh, but you cannot provide names, any information that's going to identify any of the survivors. Great. Thank you, Deborah. And then here's the visual that I promised earlier. <laughs> um, just an example, which is that, you know, folk, you may receive information from other entities, assuming that they are sharing that information with you um, correctly. So the victim services unit of the tribe or of your, you know, DV or sexual assault or stalking component of your multi-service program, they can receive information coming to them. But what may not happen is that they may not, in fact, give that information back out to those other entities without that release of information. So that is your visual. And then I think we have a few more exchanges coming up and I think I get to ask you a question now. Some of this is review, but if I work at a domestic violence project that's housed at a larger organization like YWCA or the Salvation Army, may I share a survivor's name and contact information internally, or do I need a release of information? And Deborah, it's a great review question. And again, when you work in that multi-service agency, um, 
then different rules do apply and you need a release of information to share information internally between your victim services and your non-victim services component. All right. Well, follow-up question. What if our executive director wants a list of our project's clients for grant reporting purposes, like we just talked about? We can share that, right? Nope. The answer is still no, not without a release of information. And again, just that reminder that you may not require that release of information as a condition of providing services. Oh. Uh, both of our answers came up at the same time, but what if the board of directors wants client stories for fundraising purposes, right? We know that a lot of our DVSA programs or projects within larger organizations use uh, the work that they're doing, the important work they're doing for fundraising purposes. We've got to be able to share that information, right, Jesse? Well, like I said here, um, I'm really feeling a little bit like a meanie, but the answer is still going to be no that they may not use any personally identifying information. And um, you know, there's so many reasons for that. Like I said earlier around survivor autonomy, agency, the right to self-determination, uh, safety, but the answer is still going to be no. You may not share it with them for that purpose. And this is the resource I mentioned before that there's basically a guidelines for confidentiality policies. Uh, Jesse and I helped write these policies available on the Crime Victims and Survivor Services Division website. Uh, and around this same toolkit, there are those certifications for employees that they've done the 40 hour training, including this two hour webinar, et cetera. So there's a great resource out there. Sorry, I'm trying to mute myself, but I advanced the slide by mistake. No problem. And yeah, so one more scenario, I think, uh, a survivor wants you to send her program records to the prosecutor. Her release of information expired last week. The survivor lives four hours away. She wants to give you verbal permission. Is this allowed? And if it's not allowed, what are some of the strategies for securing a written ROI from someone four hours away? What do you think, Jesse? Well, I was going to say, I have some ideas. I'll raise my hand for you to call on me. Jesse um, Minlin, front row. <laughs> thank you. So, um, well, again, you know, you, as we explained earlier, you need a written release of information executed with informed consent, which is that DARE process, in order for you to share the information with the prosecutor. Since you don't have that release of information in your with a survivor who lives you know, four hours away, there are a number of different practical solutions that you might employ. Uh, one is, you know, believe it or not, people still use faxes. I was just asked the other day, I was told I could not email um, a release of information form electronically to a healthcare provider because of their HIPAA compliance requirements and I needed to fax it and I thought, well, I'm not going to the office to fax this. So we did a workaround. Um, you may get a digital signature. Those are um, will be considered acceptable. You know, we really encourage you to do that when you are communicating with the survivor so that you know it's actually the survivor who is giving you their permission and not somebody who may have hacked them and uh, give, is giving you permission when a survivor might not want the records released. Um, you can um, ask them, email it to them, and they can print it out and take a sign it, and then take a photograph and return that photograph to you of the signed consent form. Um, there are a number of folks who are using like Adobe Acrobat or other software programs that allow you to send somebody a document electronically have them sign it, they can then, you know, lock it down so that nobody can alter that document and return it to you that way. So these are just, you know, kind of some ideas. Um, in this case, it was written records, but if it were a communication that the survivor was wanting to have with the prosecutor, you know, verbally, for example, by telephone or even by video conference, um, then I might, you know, have a conversation with the survivor. Is there a way for its it to be that it's the survivor who's sharing their information and not you as the victim service provider who's doing that. Great answers, Jesse. So 
We've talked so far, as you remember, when Jesse introduced, there were the VAWA confidentiality requirements. There are three exceptions to when you have to keep everything uh, completely confidential. One is the written informed consent that we've just been spending time on. The survivor can sign that release of information. And I hope through this conversation that we've been having, it's uh, very clear of what we were trying to say in the beginning, how significant privacy is, how important privacy is. These laws are a recognition by the legislature, by our funders, that privilege and privacy and confidentiality is so significant. We know that if survivors believe that they will have control over their information, their trust in survivor services will be reinforced, and they're more likely to share the true nature of the services they need, which help in providing safety plans, help in finding the best referrals to help survivors with, um, help in getting a restraining order that is actually going to protect them. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that. I think I got distracted a little bit in our earlier, in my earlier part about the importance of privacy. So I just wanted to make sure to say all of that explicitly and just point out how this isn't just a recognition of all of you who do this fantastic work with survivors, knowing how important privacy and privilege is, but all of these requirements coming down from the legislature, from our laws, from our funders, they recognize it as well. So again, Jesse's talked about written and informed consent and these releases of information when you have to have them um, and what that entails. And I'm going to talk now about statutory mandate. The statutory mandate is the second way uh, survivor's information can be released. And the most common statutory mandate is mandatory reporting laws. So we're going to talk about those. In Oregon, there are several mandatory reporting laws because there are different folks who they apply to. So in Oregon, there is mandatory reporting of child abuse, mandatory reporting of elder abuse, mandatory reporting of abuse of adults with developmental disabilities, substance use disorders, and serious and persistent mental illnesses. Uh, I wanna be really careful on that one. We'll talk about it briefly, but note that um, there are a lot of exceptions and a lot of caveats with that last one. And then there are certain folks who have to report certain injuries, sexually transmitted infections, or other reportable diseases. Um, and most those are mostly medical professionals. So we're not going to focus on that as much today. Um, but note that there are several areas in Oregon law where there are requirements for mandatory reporting. So in a focus on child abuse reporting, it's the one we see the most common and the others are sort of mirrored after. So you can find information about Oregon's child abuse reporting in Oregon Revised Statute 419B.010. And that statute defines what is child abuse. It lists a number of different um, types of abuse, including physical violence, neglect, um, that type of thing. Uh, it defines who is a child, and that includes uh, folks under the age of 18. And some folks, and I can't remember if we have a slide. Yes, we have a slide on it, so I'm going to wait to get to that. <laughs> but the statute defines who's a public or private official, what is reasonable cause, because in order to make a report, be mandated to make a child abuse report, the reporter has to have reasonable cause to believe that the child they've come into contact with has been abused or the perpetrator that they've come into contact with has abused a child. So the statute defines reasonable cause and it talks about when a public or private official must report. So, sorry about that. My mouse is very touchy. So uh, again, child abuse, what counts as abuse under the statute is defined in 419B.011, uh, sorry, 0 .005 sub one. And I wanna point out that not all situations of exposure to domestic violence would be considered child abuse under the Oregon law. Mm -hmm. So there may be a situation which a child is likely to get in between two parents, uh, you know, try and stop a perpetrator that is included in the definition of child abuse. So with situations where a, where a parent uh, 
or a perpetrator of abuse stops another parent from taking care of a child, those are uh, both examples of child abuse within the context of domestic violence. But simply exposure to or witnessing domestic violence does not always necessitate a report of child abuse. There is a resource that we have a link to here. This is uh, DHS, Department of Human Services, uh, resource available, what you can do about child abuse. And that actually has this section that I'm talking about, about when exposure to domestic violence may require a mandatory report or not. The statute, as we said, also defines who is a child. Uh, most of us think about children. We think of someone under the age of 18. Uh, the statute, however, does define that there are folks who are under 21 years of age who reside in or receive residential care services, usually at an adult foster care facility type organization or child care agency. But for the most part, it's folks under the age of 18. Now, one of the most important aspects of this definition is the public or private official. Public or private officials are defined at 419B.005 as well, and they include doctors and nurses, emergency medical technicians, firefighters, lawyers, foster parents. Um, you know, Jesse and I are public or private officials as, in a, as being lawyers. Uh, I want to be clear that there is an exception to certain folks like doctors and lawyers or uh, um doctors and nurses or lawyers, because if we learn about the information within a privileged communication, like an attorney client privileged communication, then we are accepted, meaning we do not have to, we are not mandated to report. Um, one of the definitions of public or private officials include employees of, or public, excuse me, of a public or private providing child care related services or activities. That's pretty significant because a number of domestic and sexual violence programs out there do provide child care related services or activities, even if it is simply providing, you know, activities for kiddos when parents are involved in support groups or when parents are receiving other services. A number of organizations provide child care related services. However, um, there is an exception to the child care related services or activities definition. It specifically excludes community based nonprofit organizations whose primary purpose is to provide confidential direct services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking. So the statute explicitly excludes most domestic and sexual violence programs out there because most DVSA programs primary purpose is to provide um, these services, confidential services to domestic and sexual assault survivors. Now note, this was the law into, until December 31st of 2021. So many of you, in fact, most of you are probably watching this webinar after this new law has changed. The new law states, uh, the new law begins January 1st, 2022, and it no longer focuses on the definition of a primary purpose of an organization. The reason why that's so significant is because, as we were talking about before, there are many multi-service agencies that have a lot wider of a primary purpose, right? The service may be to serve all of Oregon, you know, all Oregonians or something like that, um, instead of just the narrow focus. So the new law recognized that there was a, um, that some organizations or some advocates who provided uh, services to survivors may not fall under this exception. So it's been changed. As of January 1st of 2022, the list of public or private officials that are mandatory reporters, it still includes employees of public or private organizations providing child care related services or activities. But the exception, the language of the exception, it does not include employees of qualified victim services programs as defined in 147-600 that we've been talking about all, all afternoon that provides confidential direct services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking. And again, I just wanna point out that this is a very clear recognition 
by our lawmakers that folks who provide services to domestic and sexual violence survivors need to be confidential. Survivors need to feel safe to talk to these advocates without fear that a mandated report might be required, right? So when, what must one of these public or private officials make a report? I've sort of said this before, but a public or private official must make a mandatory report if they have reasonable cause to believe that they've come into contact either with the child who has suffered abuse or the person who has abused a child. So they have to come into contact with either the child who has suffered abuse or the person who has abused the child. So these all make more sense to me when I think about them in scenarios. So I'd like to do a review scenario. Let me ask you, Jesse. imagine Lori is a survivor and she tells her advocate that her husband has abused their child. Does the advocate have to report the abuse? No, the advocate does not. And the reason, do you want me to give the reason? Please. Okay. The reason is that Lori has not come, excuse me, the advocate, even if they are a mandatory reporter of child abuse, have not come in contact with a child who has been abused or with a person who is committing the abuse. Right. And Great note in there, Jesse, that if the advocate is a mandatory reporter in some other way, then they still aren't required to report because they haven't come into contact with the child. Now, let's imagine that the next day, Lori stops by to drop off some papers to her advocate. Lori's five-year-old son is now with her, and the advocate comes into contact with the five-year-old son. Now, does the advocate have to report the abuse? So if the advocate is just an advocate, not just, but if the advocate Um, does not meet any other definition of who is a public or private official, then the answer will be no. That the advocate has come in contact with a child who has been abused, but advocates per se are not mandatory reporters. They don't fall within that definition of a public or private official who has to report child abuse. All right. The next week, Lori is finally certified to become a foster parent. Um, Lori, who is so happy and so thankful for the advocate services, comes by to give the advocate a thank you note in person, and her son's with her. Now, does the advocate have to report the abuse? Yes. Now you have met all of the factors because the advocate is, in fact, a mandatory reporter. Again, nothing related to their work as an advocate but the list of public or private officials includes foster parents. And so you now have, and in Oregon, the mandatory reporting of child abuse obligation is a 24 seven obligation. So it's not like you wear, you know, sort of one hat that is your advocate hat and a different hat (laughs) and a different hat that is um, your foster parent public or private official mandatory reporter, like you wear all the hats. And so remember there was that exception we talked about a while back um, that is otherwise required by law. So Lori is now a foster parent. They're a public or private official. They've come in contact with a child whom they have reasonable cause to believe has been abused. Um, Excuse me, the advocate has, because Lori, the the survivor, the mom told the advocate that um, her son was being abused. So now, yes, a report is going to be required. Thanks. And thanks for that point about 24-7. If one of these hats makes you a mandatory reporter, you are a mandatory reporter 24-7. Even if it's at home, being a foster parent, you don't get to take that hat off, leave it at home when you go be an advocate at a DVSA program. I want to turn to elder abuse. Jesse, I think you had a question for me, and I think we've already given the answer to <laughs> for our self-assessment. Whoops. Okay, so much for perfect animation. Okay, so Deborah, at what age triggers a report of elder abuse in Oregon? That is age 65 or older, but now everybody go back and look at your self-assessment test, see how you did on this question. Um, Elder abuse, the elder abuse statute is very similar to the child abuse statute. You can find it at ORS 124060, where you'll find definitions for who is an elder, 
As we just told you, it's anyone 65 years or older. It also defines public or private official. And that list looks very similar to the definition of public or private official in the child abuse reporting, but it has a number of other folks, such as folks living in assisted living or working in assisted living facilities, for example. It also lists the types of abuse that must be mandate that mandate a report, uh, somewhat similar to the child abuse, but it includes other things as well, like neglect of by a caregiver who is responsible for providing care when a report must be made. So it's similar when the person comes into contact with the elderly person who has been abused or the uh, person who has abused the elderly person. When, uh, and what information must be provided as well as to whom a report must be made. All of that information is listed within the statute. The other type of abuse reporting we want to talk about a bit has to do with adults with developmental disabilities, adults with severe and persistent mental illnesses, and adults with substance use disorders. Now, why does this matter? Certainly, uh, this again has a list of public or private officials. So an advocate may be a public or private official required to report abuse of some of these folks. In addition, when you're referring the folks you work with to receive other services, you want to make sure that you're aware of who is a mandatory reporter. And that is true both of child abuse reporting and elder abuse reporting and of this type of reporting. If you're encouraging someone to go get counseling or therapy, for example, you want to be aware that most counselors, therapists fall under the public or private uh, official definition in most of these reporting statutes. So the statute that is uh, focused on the mandatory reporting of these uh, vulnerable adults is listed at ORS 430.735 and subsection 11 defines public or private official. Again, it's a specific list. Um, the, it also defines a developmental disability um, sorry, that's the next slide. I'm going to slip. I'm going to jump ahead, try not to jump ahead. So a person with a developmental disability or a serious persistent mental illness, if a public or private official comes into contact with a person with a developmental disability or a serious and persistent mental illness, who is receiving mental health services from a community program or facility, then, and they know that they, they have been abused, then they must make a report. But note, they must be receiving mental health services from a community program or facility. Similarly, if a per public or private official in that list comes into contact with someone who has a substance use disorder or a mental illness and are presently in a residential facility or state hospital, then they have to report. But it doesn't apply, the, mandated, the report isn't mandated unless they are in a residential facility or state hospital. I also want to note that the rules that apply to this statute make it very clear that folks with serious and persistent mental illness only qualify as the person uh, whose abuse must be reported if that person with a serious and persistent mental illness also has a serious functional impairment that currently substantially interferes with or limits their ability to protect themselves from abuse. The reason why this is important is a lot of survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault do have some serious and persistent mental illness. In fact, next to veterans of war, um, survivors have one of the highest uh, experiences, experience post-traumatic stress disorder at one of the highest rates. Uh, that can be considered a serious and persistent mental illness However, the abuse of that survivor need only be reported by a mandatory reporter if first they're receiving mental health services from that community program or facility, and also their serious and persistent mental illness currently substantially interferes with their ability to protect themselves. This is one more recognition that we want survivors to be able to be empowered to make the choices that they want to take to take care of themselves, to keep themselves safe, and to give them the power and the uh, control over their own information. 
just briefly, all of these things are defined, developmental disability, the serious and persistent mental illness, even community program is all defined by the statutes or the rules that are all here. Um, again, we've been talking about Oregon revised statute, the ORSs, but OARs are the Oregon administrative rules, which also are applicable to this specific type of mandatory reporting. Hey, Deborah, before we um, jump into duty to warn, there occurred to me that it just might be helpful to clarify um, or maybe to muddy the waters a little bit, actually, no, back on, on child abuse. Um, and that has to do with the requirement that the, the um, duty to report child abuse is triggered by when you come in contact with a child whom you have reasonable cause to believe has been abused. And I think there is a fair amount of uncertainty regarding what is quote unquote common contact. And I don't have a clear answer to offer because I think there's a fair amount of disagreement and no guidance really to answer that question. And first of all, the statute's been around for a really long time and didn't contemplate the kinds of contact that we now routinely have with individuals. So for example, is a phone call come in contact? Is it um, video conferencing? Is that come in contact? Does it have to mean coming into the physical presence of someone? Is that what is required? And there isn't a lot of guidance on it. And so I think it's um, just an area where it's really worthwhile for programs to invest in deciding, like sort of what did, the, how will they interpret it and how will they apply it? The other one, which we have talked about, and I think that the answer is very clear, but I know at least when I've attended for my mandatory continuing legal education requirements and trainings, um, others disagree with my analysis, is that I think the statute says, you know, come in contact with a child who has been abused. And as Deborah walked you through, the Oregon law defines who is a child. And for the most part, unless it's somebody who meets the residential um, care definition, et cetera, it's going to be someone who is 17 or younger, someone who's under the age of 18. And I know it's come up at trainings that I have attended where in fact, I've asked this, or well, I've only asked it after the trainer has said something with which I disagree. Um, and they, the question has been asked, well, what if you come in contact with someone who is now an adult, but was abused as a child? And I, my interpretation, which is not a legal advice, but it's just telling you my personal viewpoint on this, um, is that the person needs to be a child now, because that's what the statute says, come in contact with a child, it does not say come in contact with someone who was abused as a child. Um, and in fact, if we were mandated to report you know, um, contact with individuals who were abused as a child but are now adults, you know, we'd be reporting so often everyone's heads would be spinning. But I did just wanna offer that because it may come up and I wanna make sure that folks are equipped to, to answer that questioners at least have thought about it and have perhaps formulated a response. Thank you, Jesse. And I agree with Jesse's interpretation as well. It says when you come into contact with a child who has been abused. And so I think that's the, that's the, that's the door that opens coming into contact with that child by the Oregon definition. Thanks, Jesse. So we want to talk about one other thing that we often get a lot of questions about and often seems to complicate this conversation about reporting and mandatory reporting. So a lot of folks come to us and say, do I have a duty to warn if someone is a danger to themselves or others, right? And it's clear that a certified advocate or qualified victim services program may disclose confidential communications or records records without the victim's consent as otherwise required by law, right? We've talked about that's in the Oregon statute. We've talked about if there's a statutory mandate that requires a report to be made, then there's that exception. It's required, but required is the key word here. 
Oregon Revised Statute 179505, the duty to warn if someone's a danger to themselves or others applies to healthcare providers. And it's relevant to information obtained in the course of diagnosis, evaluation, or treatment. And in fact, what the statute says is that the information may be reported. So if something may be reported, it is not required to be reported. Therefore, it's not a legal mandate in Oregon. There is no duty requirement or mandate to warn if someone is a risk to themselves or others in Oregon by anybody. And note that even the may be reported only applies specifically by statute to healthcare providers. So we just wanted to mention this briefly. It's a question we get often, but there is not a duty to warn under Oregon law. So may be reported is not a legal mandate, right? And we're talking here about the exceptions to um, VAWA confidentiality, when something may be reported, and therefore it is not a legal mandate. I think we were going to save the no for animation on this one too, but we're just being very generous today, giving you all the answers with all the questions. <laughs> but just as a review, may an advocate who is not a mandatory reporter, so does not have any of those hats of a volunteer firefighter or a, a foster parent or you know a therapist, right? May an advocate who is not a mandatory reporter report child abuse, elder abuse, or other abuse because they're concerned for someone's safety. And spoiler alert, Jesse, what do you think? <laughs> if they are um, not a mandatory reporter, they may not report. Right. And so just a quick review, uh, Jana is employed six hours a week at a college women's center. Edwina goes to the women's center to help after she was sexually assaulted. Edwina mentions that her birthday is next week and she's excited to turn 18. Jesse, is Jana required to report Edwina's assault to Child Protective Services or to law enforcement? Well, this actually is probably a little trickier than I think than folks might presume because the answer is going to be yes. Jana is required to report. And you may be going like, what? Why? You've just been telling us that advocates um, or uh, confidential advocates who work for a QVSP um, are covered by certified advocate privilege. And it could be like a women's center or a health center or other um, school-based entity that receives you know, the, the money from the proper funding source, et cetera, will fit the definition of qualified victim services program. However, remember again, there's that otherwise required by law exception. And when we review this list of public or private official, as we've highlighted and read for you, school employees are public or private official. So if you just bounce back, Deborah, if you bounce back just for one moment to slide 85, Jenna in this scenario is employed by the college's women's center. If Jenna were a volunteer at the women's center, then going forward to the next one, oops, J oh. <laughs> then Jana would not meet the definition of a school employee and the public or private official um, requirement of mandatory reporting would not be triggered. So again, you need to know, um, are they an employee? Are they a volunteer? And this is probably a really great time to emphasize that especially for those of you who are in any kind of a supervisory um, or director position and or have those responsibilities at your program, I just, we wanna emphasize that you need to know whether anybody who works for you or who volunteers for you is a mandatory reporter, whether it's child abuse, elder abuse, you know, a person with severe and persistent mental illness, substance use disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Because they may not be a mandated reporter if they're volunteering for you um, because of the various provisions in Oregon law. But again, if they fall within this larger list in sort of other 
you know, parts of their lives of a public or private official. They may be, and you absolutely need to know that. Why do you need to know it? Because survivors have the right to know if they are speaking and sharing their personal information with someone who is then going to have to report it before that survivor makes any kind of a disclosure. So if someone is a mandatory reporter, they come into contact with a child who has been abused or a a perpetrator who has abused a child, et cetera, then what must be reported? The statute defines information that must be reported in each of the different mandatory reporting laws. With respect to child abuse, you have to give the child's names and addresses if you know them, the child's age, parents, other or other persons responsible for the child's care, any explanation given for the abuse, nature and the extent of the abuse, or any other information that the person making the report believes might be helpful in establishing the cause of abuse and the identity of the perpetrator. Note that none of this includes things such as someone's immigration status or a person's gender identity or um, you know, it, things that are outside of this list. Therefore, if a advocate who works at a DVSA program is also a mandatory reporter, they may only report what is mandated So they may only report the information on this list. They may not share any information outside of this list because they find it interesting, because they, you know, for whatever other reason, they may only share the information on this list and revealing any other information without a release of information uh, would be in violation of the confidentiality requirements and laws that we have. So we need to ask ourselves, everybody who works together uh, at a DVSA program, you need to know this about yourselves and the folks you work with. Are you a mandatory reporter? If you are, is the survivor uh, someone whose abuse or injury must be reported, right? Are they a child? Are they an elder over the age of 65? Are they a person with a severe and persistent mental illness, et cetera? If they are, You need to know if they have experienced abuse or injury as defined in the statute, right? Is their abuse something that I think should be considered abuse or is it something that's defined as abuse in the statute? If so, you need to know if you're exempt from reporting, right? As I told you before, briefly, Jesse and I are attorneys. We are mandatory reporters under that public or private definition, but there is an exemption that says If we learn about abuse during our attorney-client relationship, we cannot reveal that information. So we're exempt or we're exempt from reporting. Mm -hmm. If you're not exempt from reporting, then you have to know what must be reported. Again, if you have, if you're a DVSA advocate and you may not report without one of these three things, without a release of information, statutory mandate, or court mandate, you can only report what's mandated to report. If you do have to report and you have to report without a release of information signed by the survivor, you have to make reasonable efforts to notify victims affected by the disclosure of the information And you have to take steps necessary to protect the privacy and the safety of the affected persons. So you have to make all efforts, all reasonable efforts to reach out to the survivor, let the survivor know that you have to share this information, and then help the survivor around something such as safety planning. If revealing this information is going to cause safety concerns or privacy concerns. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, is to be proactive. Jesse sort of said this before, know who in your organization is a mandatory reporter, right? Make sure the survivor knows that you are a mandatory reporter if you are, or if you're asking to the survivor to sign a release of information to share their confidential information with someone else, make sure as a part of that release of information, as a part of that informed conversation you're having with the survivor, you let the survivor know this other person is a mandatory reporter of fill in the blank, child abuse, elder abuse, et cetera. You need to establish clear boundaries internally and externally. If you know someone in your organization provides counseling or therapy to the survivors that you work with, and they're a mandatory reporter, make sure they're not at the um, set 
same staffing meetings, if you're sharing uh, information about the survivor's case that may initiate a report. And again, if you're making a referral, be crystal clear, you know about the reporting obligations uh, of the group or program you're referring the survivor to or providing that information to. Jesse, do you have anything to add to that list? I just think this is so important. Um, thanks. The only thing I think I would add, you did a great job on this, Deborah, is that as you were talking, I remembered that um, at the Victim Rights Law Center, I created a chart a number of years back that kind of on one side has um, sort of the different categories of individuals mm -hmm. who are covered by Oregon's mandatory reporting laws. And then across the top, the agencies um, or providers to whom you might be providing referrals. So it might say, for example, you know, mental health counselor across the top and a minor on the bottom. And where those two intersect, there you would put an X because a mental health care um, provider in Oregon is a mandatory reporter of child abuse. And similarly, you'd have an X at, um, at elder abuse. Or you might have, if you refer routinely or infrequently even um, to lawyers, you might, you know, sort of, yeah, there might be an X in the mandatory reporter box, but you would definitely need a huge asterisk or some explanation that made it very clear that even though we're mandatory reporters um, outside of the work context, we do fall within one of those exceptions. Like, you know, we have that slide with all the hats, right? And we actually do get to take our hat off. There are very few limited number of professionals in Oregon and um, attorneys fall in one of those. So anyway, I could always, um, I think we give our email address at the, uh, at the end and we could always happy to share that chart. Okay, so the third and final category of exception, remember I told you at the very beginning, there were three exceptions to VAWA. There was um, uh, written and informed consent, statutory mandate, and the third one is court mandate. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now on the issue of court mandate. Well, the first question is, well, what's a court mandate? And, you know, the sort of legalese version is it's a judicial command or order, a precept. It could be written, it could be oral. You might be in court, the judge is sitting on the bench and issues an order. Um, and I think that's sort of really the easier category to ascertain. We have Oregon subpoena question mark, because in Oregon, a subpoena is actually issued by a party to a case. So it may be issued you know, by um, the attorney who represents a party and it's served on, the, on uh, either the other side or it's served on a witness um, who's being subpoenaed either to produce records or to give testimony but it doesn't actually ever go through the judge's hands. And so can you make an argument that that's not um, a court mandate if what you've gotten is a subpoena? Now you look at the Oregon Rules of Civil Procedure, they're sometimes referred to as the ORCIPs. It talks about, um, uh, about a subpoena being a civil order or court order. But we just kind of want to flag that as a potential argument that is out there. And then the other piece to emphasize is that a court mandate does include case law. So if there is a court, um, excuse me, a published case in which um, a certain kind of provider was found to be required to produce certain documents or to share certain information, and it applies in uh, the next situation that would include that would apply because that would be the case law court mandate. We always think it's just really worth discussing. So, if there is a court mandate, what do you do? What are some things you know that you might do? And again, this is just a place where we would invite you to hit the pause button and jot down some ideas that if you felt there was a court mandate to share personally identifying or personal or confidential information about a survivor who you'd served, or maybe even who you hadn't served. Um, but of course, if you only object, for example, to subpoenas or court orders, um, when you've actually served that survivor, that's pretty much a, an indication that they have sought or, um, and received services at your organization. So you might just you know, jot some of those ideas down and then come back and resume 
when you want to see here what our ideas are. So I'm gonna wait just a moment and give people an opportunity to pause and answer the questions. And now we'll share with you some of our responses. And the first is, how does the survivor want to proceed? Sometimes they want the information shared, sometimes they don't. And you want to make sure to try and contact the survivor to find out. And again, remember when Deborah was walking through the statutory mandate, she said, if you do have to release information pursuant to a statutory court mandate, there are two things that you need to do. And one of them is reasonable steps to try and notify the victim and the other address the safety of persons who would be impacted by the release. So what does the survivor want to proceed? Second is really to assess, and you, you know, may or may not need legal advice um, from someone that your organization has a relationship with, um, an attorney, which is, was the order correctly issued? Judges are human, judges make mistakes. And what legal options might exist to try and um, ask the court to reconsider that court order or ask them to put a stay to hold that court order um, to allow you to bring some kind of appeal for it. Um, we put that toothbrush up there because I don't know if it still is, but certainly there used to be in advocacy circles, the joke that if you were going to refuse the court order, you better bring your toothbrush to court in case they took you into custody. And then, of course, an important consideration is, well, well you know, what protective measures need to be taken um, to try and make sure that the survivor and anybody else who might be affected by the disclosure, um, you are engaging in some safety planning with them. So, you know, just to recap, if the judge orders disclosure, what can you do? You know, one is that file a motion to quash, right? If it's a subpoena and the judge says, I'm going to um, find it enforceable, I want you to produce the documents or the testimony, you file a motion to quash that subpoena or think of it as a motion to squash. I think they should have named it that. Um, you can ask the judge for permission if it's producing records to say that, you know, not all of those records are relevant to what the other side has been asking for and the judge told you to um, produce. And so you want permission to go through those court records yourself and to block out any discussion, for example, of other people that might be referenced. Let's say for some reason you were being ordered to produce court records around um, group counseling. You would definitely want to ask for permission to redact any information about anybody else that might have participated in that group counseling. Um, you know, a third option is to request in-camera review, and that is for the judge to review the documents before they're provided to the other side. I think judges often think, well, just produce it all to me and I'll decide what's relevant without pausing and thinking about how for a survivor, having the judge review it, having the judge review their mental health records or their medical records or their diary or anything else that might have been ordered, you know, that too feels like a violation. It's not somehow that they're exempt just because they're the judge. You might um, work with a lawyer to file a motion for a protective order, which could put certain limitations on who can access um, those records. Maybe the attorney is allowed to access them, but is it ordered not to share them with their client or they go into the court file so they're um, under seal so that they're not available, just generally speaking to anybody who may come and request a copy of the court file. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you might ask for a stay of the judge's order, ask for them to put a hold on their order to allow you to appeal it. And again, just uh, reiterating what I had already mentioned and reviewed and what Deborah had gone over with you as well, which is that if you do have to produce it pursuant to a court mandate or a statutory mandate, you need to take these two important steps, make reasonable efforts to notify the victim and also steps to protect the privacy and the safety of other people who are affected by the disclosure who may be broader than the just the survivor. And then just a reminder really here that, you know, VAWA requires one of these three circumstances, right? Written and informed consent, having to disclose this information um, is required by a statute or statutory mandate or by a court or court mandate. And then just a reminder that the Oregon Crime Victim and Survivor Services Division funding that probably all of your organizations receive if you're watching this video, that that funding stream also requires confidentiality. Um, but again, that Oregon law does allow the disclosure of confidential information when it meets this as otherwise required by law exception. Oh, 
I swear we animated this. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> everyone. Um, but Deborah, I'm going to go ahead and ask it of you anyway. So you have a survivor who's receiving services at your program. And unfortunately, we all know that this has happened is that they are found um, dead. And law enforcement contacts you as part of their law enforcement investigation. What information, if any, may you share? As we've been talking about, you may not disclose anything without a release of information. And what about with the survivor's family? May you share information with their family? Again, not without a release of information. Advocate privilege and vow of confidentiality survive death in Oregon, meaning you have to keep that information confidential, even if a survivor dies. And is there any information excuse me, any situation in which you may disclose that information? Well, yes, thanks for asking. There's a very limited situation under what's called uh, fatality reviews. And VAWA specifically says you may share personally identifying information about deceased victims for fatality review purposes to the extent permitted by the law of that jurisdiction. So remember, VAWA is the federal law and says you can do it in an Oregon fatality review to the extent that the Oregon fatality review allows, but only if Oregon's fatality reviews qualifies under the federal law. It's the sole purpose is to prevent future deaths. The team has its own protocols and procedures to protect identifying information about the victim and the children from further disclosure, reasonable efforts to get release from um, others like the surviving children or personal representatives um, are uh, try to get that information or that release uh, permission to release that information. And the information is only released limited to the purposes of the fatality review. The good news is the Oregon law has looked at the federal law and made sure that Oregon's fatality reviews do fall in line perfectly with VAWA's requirements. And, you know, Deborah, just one other thought on that, um, that I know some programs are doing, which is particularly in cases that are high lethality risk, they're talking with the survivor in advance um, which is if in the event that you disappear or that you're found dead, um, do you want us to share certain information? And if so, what information do you want us to share and with whom? Obviously that can be a difficult conversation to have, but um, survivors know their realities. They're, they are in the best position to assess some of the, the danger that they may be in. So that's just another approach to that. Yeah, thanks for that, Jesse. And then, um, last but certainly not least, we're going to turn to this question of data breaches and inadvertent disclosures because we know that they do happen. And they're actually, again, for anybody that is receiving federal funds, um, there is a requirement regarding this uh, to report and everybody has, every organization or entity um, that receives federal funding needs to have a data breach policy. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more in just a moment. But first, I want to give some examples of what are some common breaches. It's people losing documents. Um, you know, you could learn lose, for example, here it's a flash drive, mailing documents that are not double wrapped, and so they get opened up in transport. I've gotten my fair share of documents that have, you know, arrived opened, including the PIN number for a credit card not that long ago, that obviously have been left out on the tarmac. It arrived sopping wet. Um, folks who leave a computer or files or a briefcase or something else in a car that gets broken into, um, or allow other people access to their computer, not typically worried about tiny little babies who aren't reading, um, but I thought we could all use a smile as an example. Losing a cell phone, not having a password on a cell phone, or having a, your cell phone password protected, but other in your, people in your family have access to it. Um, and then of course, speaking about confidential information in a place where other people can overhear you. And as I mentioned, there's a federal law that requires um, anyone who receives federal funding to have, first of all, written procedures to respond to an actual or an imminent breach um, and also to report an actual or imminent breach of personally identifying information to the appropriate funder within 24 hours. 
So for example, if somebody loses a client file um, and you know you don't actually know whether or not uh, somebody accessed it, but it really is gonna be an imminent breach, you report that. If your cell phone gets lost or stolen or a computer and it's not password protected, that's definitely an imminent breach. So you must have written procedures on how you're going to respond if this situation arises and also you most must report it to the appropriate funder within 24 hours. By appropriate funder, I mean, for example, if this is a CVSSD or a VOCA funded case, you're going to report it to your CVSSD manager or your VOCA manager. If it was a case, the services were funded by the Office on Violence Against Women through the Violence Against Women Act, you're going to report it to your OVW program manager. And it might be that the survivor was being served um, by multiple grants, in which case you're going to need to report it to multiple funders. So again, I just want to emphasize, um, and Oregon also has some specific consumer um, protection laws that may also be implicated here, but the bottom line message is you need to have a policy and you need to be doing the reporting if there is an actual or an imminent breach. Some best practices, and some of these I want to emphasize come not from me personally, but from the uh, Office of Management and Budget at the federal level. Double wrapping, when you are mailing packets of information, they're very likely to, to tear open or more likely than other documents. You want to require passwords, not, you know, don't have like the name of your child that everybody knows. Um, requirements of changing passwords, a certain complexity, uppercase, lowercase, uh, number, um, exclamation points or asterisks or whatever. If folks are using personal devices for their work and that personal device will be able to access or um, it will have on it any information about survivors being served, you absolutely want to have the ability to wipe that device um, or for the person who's using their personal device to have the ability to wipe it in the event that it's lost or stolen. If you're working with contractors, make sure that you have some kind of a privacy confidentiality non-disclosure agreement with them. And then just if there are any organizations out there that are still asking for social security numbers, um, the federal law requires you to actually limit the unnecessary use of social security numbers, so don't be asking for them unless there's a particular reason um, that you need it, and then only ask for it when you do need it. So that's just a quick recap around the data privacy um, and breaches and some best practices. Finally, um, I know on behalf of Deborah and myself, we and the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, we wanted to say thank you to all of you for attending today for um, staying with us through this presentation for your commitment to survivor privacy and survivor safety and agency and autonomy. And thank you most of all for all the just truly life-saving work that you do to help end sexual violence, domestic violence, stalking, dating violence, and human trafficking. We honor you, we celebrate you, and we stand with you. Thank you.